Orgasmic Enlightenment, where the sexual and spiritual come together. I'm Kim Anami, and I'm a holistic sex and relationship coach and a vaginal weightlifter. In this show, we explore all things intimate. I believe that our sexual energy is life force, creative energy, and we can use it to shape our worlds, strengthen our relationships, and self-actualize. I blend the most avant-garde information from neuroscience, ancient sexual practices like Tantra and Taoism to renegade wellness modalities to show you how to create gourmet sex in your lives. Come one, come all. What is free birth? The parallels between birth and sex are many. The crux of my work is my belief that every person is a natural born lover. Every one of us has a high libido, is multi-orgasmic, capable of every kind of orgasm, and can have a wildly satisfying sex life. What gets in the way of this are people's blocks. These can be many, ranging from a past history of sexual trauma to simply being a product of the cultural conditioning of the day. All of these things can have the effect of suppressing a person's natural sexual expression. My work is all about helping people to clear these blockages and free up the natural flow and power that lies beneath them. The exact same thing applies to birth. And it has to, doesn't it? For the survival of the species, we have to be good at this, don't we? I believe in and I have seen the same reasoning apply. All women are natural birthers, but what obscures that innate knowledge is a multitude of blocks. In our culture, we are told from a religious standpoint that birth is supposed to be a punishment from God because Eve is such a hoe. We see constant messages in movies and television of women in excruciating pain during birth and that they're always being saved or at the very least helped by someone more knowledgeable than she is while she is literally being tied down and is a passive observer through the whole experience. So the work here is untangling all of this programming and getting back to the truth. The other connection between sex and birth is that, as Ina May Gaskin says, the energy that got the baby in gets the baby out, meaning not only do we want to eliminate outside distractions and create a safe, sacred, private space, we also want to allow the full sensuality of the experience to overtake us. The hormone oxytocin is what really gets things going, and guess what produces a massive amount of it? Your orgasm. The more you can allow the deep sexual opening of the cervix, you'll have the biggest cervical orgasm of your life and your baby will just slide right out. I spoke on this in last week's episode on birth orgasms. It's a video version of the podcast. And if you want to see one as in a birth orgasm, then check out the video on my YouTube channel. When I did my deep dive research into the modern birthing world last year as I was putting together my Sexy Mama program, I was shocked and horrified to see how medicalized birth had become. Rather than the natural, free-flowing, self-actualizing experience that it ought to be, it's now looked at as a crisis and an emergency to be managed. Women are being told that unlike every other female on the planet, this is something they simply cannot do on their own without assistance from a self-appointed expert such as a medical doctor or OBGYN. While some midwives are still holding the torch for women-led birth, because of increasingly strict regulations around their practice, they're forced more and more to conform to allopathic standards of care and intervention. Women's bodies all through the reproductive years and beyond are the make-work project of the century for OBGYNs. From having women on constant birth control to surgically removing their babies and their internal organs to then having them on hormones for the rest of their lives to deal with removing their organs, women are this amazing cash cow for OBGYNs. And while I understand that birth emergencies can happen that may benefit from intervention, the legitimate amount of emergencies is stunningly less than we have been led to believe. What I also saw is that there is now this manufacturing of emergencies, or not even, women are simply invited to have C-sections as though they're no big deal. 
There are a myriad of problems with this. First off, birthing vaginally affects everything from the shape of the baby's skull to populating the microbiome of the baby. Even medical doctors have begun to realize this so that when a baby is not born vaginally, they take a swab from the mother's vagina and they smear it on the baby's mouth. Nature is smart. Fucking with nature isn't. What I also found in my forays around the internet is that there is a whole movement afoot called free birthing. This term applies to women who are birthing their babies without outside assistance. So a free birth might look like a woman, her partner, their kids, and their pets in their home. And that's it. Women doing it for themselves. Even though because of what we've been taught or rather programmed to believe about birth, this actually creates the most safe and ideal circumstances for a woman to birth within, where she has the safety and the security of her own environment. She's surrounded by people she loves. She's able to tune into her own body's messages and rhythms without being distracted and interrupted by other people's ideas of timing and their agendas of what they think birth ought to look like. The whole premise of free birthing rests on the idea that a woman's body has been genetically programmed, I mean, duh, of course it has, to birth a baby. It and she know what to do. Wow, what a thought. <laughs> there are certain scenarios then that best allow this instinctual knowledge to emerge and other scenarios that interfere with this process and create stalled out labor and birth emergencies. To talk about all of this, I have two guests today on the podcast. The first is Emily Saldaya, and she is the founder of the Free Birth Society and a leader in this movement to restore power to women in the birthing process. She's a doula who used to work in the industrial birth setting, and she became increasingly, well, disgusted by what she saw. And now she is the host of the Free Birth Society podcast, and it is amazing. On it, she interviews women on their free birth stories. And many of the women she speaks to who chose to free birth had previous children in the standard hospital setting. They felt dissatisfied with their experiences, or they just heard about free birthing and they got really inspired by that. And then they had their subsequent births in their own homes under the guidance of their own bodies. And this includes women who had originally things like C-sections. And then there are women like our second guest, Hannah, who free birthed her first baby right out of the gate. She is an amazing story to tell of how her intuition and body guided her through every step of the process. As I've said in each of these podcasts on this topic of modern birth, my intention is not to shame or blame anyone who went through the hospital system for their births. I'm here to show you that there are other ways to do these things and that the information that you may have been given about the ideal circumstances for birth aren't entirely accurate, even from a scientific point of view. The Sexy Mama Salon I created is designed to systematically go through and break down down each of the myths and misinformation about everything from conception through pregnancy, childbirth, postpartum, and early childhood, and to help you reprogram yourself with the truth, as in your own truth and your body's truth. So now let's hear from Emily. As I said, she is the trailblazing leader and founder of the Free Birth Society. She was a doula for over 10 years until the reality of her complicity with the obstetric system and the harm that it does to women and babies prompted her to find a better way. She evolved into a radical birth keeper who serves women birthing outside the system. She founded the Free Birth Society prior to the conscious conception of her first child, and then she went on to give birth to her daughter freely on Maui, Hawaii. Her acclaimed podcast, the Free Birth Society podcast, quickly became a fan favorite and has reached millions of people. Welcome, Emily. It's fantastic to have you here. Thanks so much. I'm happy to be here. So let's just dive right in. Let's go into this concept that, you know, as a species, women, females have been giving birth all in, in every aspect of the animal kingdom for ever since we've existed. And yet we're the only species that seems to have so much trouble with giving birth, you know, where most animals give birth easily, safely, potentially even painlessly. And we've learned that women, human women can give birth orgasmically when we are left under 
disturbed. So most people have heard of the concept of home birth, but can you tell us what free birthing is and how you define it? Yeah, totally. So free birth is just birth um, at home, integrated as a, a normal part of a woman's life. And so she's remaining at home and she's choosing to not opt into the medical system. So she's choosing to not hire any authorities to come be present with her at birth. So it also could be referred to as a family-centered birth, um, a mother-led birth. And so those those are all implying that there's no other, there's no hierarchical um, care structure in the room. It is um, usually just loved ones and family members. Um, and again, I think an important part here is that there's no hired professionals. Um, and if you've ever heard about it before, it's typically also used uh, the phrase unassisted birth. Uh, they're basically the same thing. It means without medical assistance. And then there can, you know, you get into the more nuances. Well, what if you hire a doula or what if, what if it's an accidental free birth, you know, and the midwife couldn't make it. Um, and I personally would say that those aren't free births. I think free births, um, to claim that title, uh, is, is very deeply intentional, um, and that there's no hired professionals present. Got it. So can you tell us how you came to found the Free Birth Society and how did you become interested in birth in general? What happened along the way that led you to be passionate and, you know, really promoting this idea of free birthing as opposed to, say, midwifery, which some people already see as being an extreme thing to do? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think I, I even want to just adjust that word promoting um, versus uh more like a remembering, you know, I, I'm really clear with my intention and my, um, my efforts in the world are not to convert anybody. They're not to convince anybody, um, but rather to provide a space where if this is resonant with you, and if this feels like a, a light bulb, you know, coming home experience for you, when you listen to my podcast or you take the course or, um, or you've discovered this idea in yourself, uh, we're a community of women who, uh, trust you, you know, and that, that's really what it is. So, um, where it got started for me, I mean, I've been interested in birth and, and motherhood my life. And uh, I left I left high school rather early when I was 16 and moved to L.A. And on the with the support of my parents, but they asked me, um, you know, just to please have a plan. And so I took that to heart. And as I kind of assessed in my 16 year old brain what I thought was important, I kind of, you know, it's a little dark, but I kept coming back to um, the cycle of mother baby and a, a friend of mine in high school had actually just been raped and it was heavy on my heart. Um, and I just, I couldn't stop thinking about it. And I kept laying in bed thinking what matters, what really matters. And the two things I came up with first was the trash epidemic that we have in our, in our world. And I was like, okay, I don't really know how to approach that. And then the second thing was birth and, and this, you know, pretty like young, but, but still true to this day, a uh, realization that when a mother baby is honored, respected, loved, you know, when there's healthy attachment, when there's contented infancy, when there's blissful postpartum, um, you know, health, that's where health begins. And so, um, yeah, that was kind of just the light bulb moment for me. That was not a surprise because I'd always been the person in the neighborhood that was like babysitting the little kids and uh, went out to LA. I took an infant massage training um, and I got involved with teaching infant massage to parents whose babies had special needs, were having open heart surgery and or were in hospice. And I very quickly saw, um, I really quickly saw what it what happened when a mother was supported to be in her instinct and to be in her intuition. These were women who were, uh, you know, dealing with their babies in such a medicalized environment. Some of them hadn't even really touched their babies. You know, their babies might be in an incubator or, um, you know, all these different setups that they have in NICU. And so 
I I don't even remember how I was allowed into these spaces, but I started uh, essentially kind of what I guess we would know as Reiki, but I never called it that because I was in medical environments and, you know, you can't use the word energy in medical environments. <laughs> and so uh, anyway, it was, it was profound. And I really saw a quick transformation uh, when a woman was just supported by another woman to love and be present and talk to her baby and, and to take some authority over uh, the energetic bond and so that that was a big a big learning curve for me and then whatever I'll cut through a couple years I went to India I did some other stuff I joined a circus and then when I was landed back in LA <laughs> yeah, we'll cut through those years <laughs> story Enough for another time the circus right don't we <laughs> totally um, and so yeah I I started a doula company and it really found me I was invited to a couple of births of friends that uh, were older than me. And I saw some really blissful, really beautiful, really euphoric, ecstatic births at home uh, that were reasonably uninterrupted and reasonably mother led. And, you know, it's like touching, uh, it's like touching God, you know, it's like, it's like witnessing the most divine power, um, like cosmic power running through a, a, an instrument, you know, of a female body. It's just so, so beautiful. And so then I took a training and admittedly, I got a bit wrapped up in the professionalism of it. You know, I was really young and I became very successful very quickly and was going to hospitals and in all settings and was simultaneously devastated to see what was happening in the hospitals. But also I didn't really have the tools yet to talk about it and to digest it. Um, it always felt wrong. I remember my, the fourth birth I ever went to was, was at a hospital in LA and the woman had so much drama in her birth, nothing to do with her, just the triage nurse. And they tried to send her home and then whatever, just, just kind of unnecessary drama. And then towards the end, she got an epidural and uh, this is a family from Ethiopia. And towards the end, they just came in and basically said time's up and they vacuum suctioned the baby and they cut the mom um, very deeply uh, on her perineum. And I remember leaving that birth. I was like 18, 19 and calling my mom crying and going, what the fuck did I just see? Like, what, what was that? And is that normal? Because I also just saw one of my best friends give birth in total ecstasy a year ago. <laughs> and so you know, like, what do I do? You know, and I, and I just was so young and I didn't really know. And again, you know, bringing back that professionalism, um, my business took off. I was making money. People, you know, wanted me at their birth. I was feeling important. I was feeling like I had clarity of what I was doing all the while. If I'm being honest, there was a ethical dilemma going on with that I was seeing and I just didn't know what to do about it. And so I believed the lie that many doulas believe and still believe, which is, um, you know, that it's good enough to at least have someone there while they're being raped, you know, right. at least have someone there while they're being sabotaged and assaulted. And uh, I played that role, you know, for a long time. I've, I've held women's hands while um, horrible, horrible, horrible violations have happened to their bodies. And, you know, the doctor was looking to me to calm them down. Um, oh my God. You know, it totally makes me cringe now. And it made me cringe then too. But, but, you know, as a doula, there's a lot of, there's a lot of, what's the right word? Like massaging you into being um, complacent, you know, into being a bridge. I'm using air quotes for those who can't see me, you know, a bridge to the system. And uh, this lie that we are somehow going to increase a woman's authority and decrease her abuse. And it's simply not true. And so it took me quite a while to really wrap my head around that. And by the time I started wrapping my head around it, I was already in deep. I mean, I was going to five to 10 births a month. I was making a ton of money. I felt very important. I was a midwife's assistant. I was running a midwifery um, office. I was blah, blah, blah. You know, I started a nonprofit for doulas to serve low income women. I was in it. And when I got closer, I'll just kind of jump ahead a little bit. When I got closer to knowing it was time to conceive my first child, 
uh, I had to take a really hard look at all of this and be like, okay, where am I going to be in my pregnancy and birth and who's going to be with me? And if I know that I would never have a licensed midwife with me because of how much uh, <laughs> legal sabotage, you know, how, how beholden they are to a system that doesn't have mother baby, you know, in their best interest, then what am I going to do? And so it kind of quickly came together for me maybe four, four years ago that uh, it wasn't ethical for me to stay inside the system as a woman serving other women inside the system because I wasn't actually affecting change. It was a, a, a tough pill to swallow to really accept um, that I had been lying to myself and that I was actually completely enabling the system. And, and I guess the last piece I want to say about that before we get into the the fun, the more fun part of the story of free birth and what was born from all of those realizations is, you know, I just want to be very clear if, if, if you know, if you're listening to this and you haven't um, heard someone talk, you know, about it like this, I just want to say from my own experience and, you know, also from, from hundreds of, of other birth workers who have worked in the system, my experience consistently has been um, one of providers using a hierarchical model of care to disempower women and to sabotage what could otherwise be a very normal and very ecstatic and very powerful um, beginning to a mother and to a family. And so I've witnessed hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of births uh, in the system. And the, the common denominator is um, some level of abuse and sabotage and I don't say that lightly. That's not, um, that's not something that's like an attack on any particular person. You might have had a wonderful nurse. You might even really love your hospital birth experience. And that's wonderful. You know, this conversation isn't to take away from that. Um, it's more about look, pulling back out of our individual experiences and learning to critique um, a system that we know is objectively harming the mammalian hormonal blueprint of labor and birth and postpartum that is inherent, that is critical to optimal bonding, uh, which lays the foundation for the rest of our lives with our children. And obviously all of us have been born from a woman. And so we carry our birth story, uh, you know, somatically in our body, we carry it, you know, in our minds, we carry it uh, very, very much. And so that will be expressed in many ways throughout our lives, uh, whether we're aware of it or not. And so, um, yeah, anyway, it's a big topic and there's a lot I could say, but, but essentially I got to a point where I was seeing so much rape and so much obstetrical violence and so much just, oh, brutal, brutal sabotage, um, that I finally got some language for it and, and figured out how to really critique the system and, um, and step away from it. And so I essentially decided made a commitment within myself to become part of a paradigm that I wanted to see and, and become an example uh, for myself, you know, of what I wanted to see in the world and, and, and hopefully become a lighthouse for other women to see another way that might feel uh, more respectful to this massive, massive rite of passage that most women go through, which is motherhood. Right. Yeah, you said a lot of amazing stuff there. So we're going to backtrack a little bit and unpack some of it. So we'll come to the concept of birth rape in a moment, because I agree with you. But for those people who might find this a shocking term, they have never associated with birth before, we'll come back to that in a moment. But I think the starting place is, and you touched on this, is that we as females, like every other female in the animal kingdom are genetically programmed, like in every cell of our DNA, reproduction is the most important act of the species, either, right. you know, having sex and then giving birth to keep the species alive. And so it serves nature. It seems the most obvious thing that nature is going to program as it does. If you've ever watched an animal give birth, no one, they've never gone to a midwife or an OBGYN. They've never gone anywhere, but simply tuned into themselves 
and their own innate wisdom that's guiding them through this entire process. And what you've said and what we know is that there's this entire physiological like, you know, gear system in place that one thing leads to another thing and everything is connected. And so in terms of our hormonal letdown, our oxytocin flow, all of these hormones and neurotransmitters that are essential in the birth process that even make it, you know, more likely that a woman will easily breastfeed after birth versus having trouble breastfeeding after birth. Absolutely. And, yeah. And right. So all of the things that happen in a hospital environment, I mean, from the very beginning, even being in a hospital environment, if we even look at animals in the animal kingdom, what do we see? If everyone has a pet dog or a pet cat and they've ever given birth, what do they do? Do they climb onto the kitchen table and open up their legs for everyone to see at dinner time, Or do they find the most private, dark, sheltered place they can, maybe under a bed or in a closet and get into themselves and they give birth there? And then the whole hospital environment, the message that women are getting, and this starts in pregnancy, is you don't know how to do this. I know how to do this better. I am the expert. You are not an expert. As a woman and, who's pregnant. And it starts, it starts way before pregnancy, Sure. right? It starts, I mean, from, from the time you first start bleeding, most women are going to OBGYNs, right? So right. It, it, and even before yeah. that, your mom's taking you to a pediatrician. So the, the idea of the expert is outside of us we're born with that shit, right? It, it happens from the beginning and even more so with females. So I didn't mean to cut you off. Yeah, but no, it, definitely. It, I did a podcast recently that. called Don't Take It Lying Down, which was a response, like, you know, for example, like I don't go to OBGYNs, I don't get pap smears. And I wasn't ever saying that anyone shouldn't. I was saying that I don't, right? And explaining why I don't, because I know what my body's messages are. And I listen to those mm -hmm. and I honor those. And I don't believe that someone outside of me knows more about my body than I do. Yes. I'm very in tune with my body and I've done years of work and health focus to create that in myself, but that's where it is. So I agree with you fully on that. And so within that whole experience, like I believe that, you know, this is meant to be one of the most powerful, transformative, self-actualizing experiences of a woman's life is giving birth. And it is, I believe, when women are left to their own devices and have that natural experience of birth. I believe it can be a lot less so when they're and really entered into the system. And then rather than this being a, a, a situation where they listen to themselves, they let their body, you've said many times mother led, right? That their bodies are leading the way and telling them what to do. They're either looking to an outside authority for guidance or someone is simply telling them exactly what's going to happen. And it's really interesting that first story that you gave where the birth is going along and then at some arbitrary time, someone just steps in to say, well, that's time. And it's so mm -hmm. funny that well, not funny, but I mean, if you look at the stats, you know, the majority of hospital births in the U.S. take place between nine to five on one Monday to Friday. And so there's a vested interest in funneling women into these convenient hours where it's like, oh, time's up, time for C-section, you know, or whatever that might be. So let's... Um, you know, we're on the same page, obviously, about birth being something that every woman has the capability to do. Just the way that I say that every woman is capable of having vaginal orgasms, G-spot orgasms, cervical orgasms, and squirting across the room. This isn't just like some women can and some women can't. And I say, and I'm probably you would agree, that every woman is capable of having a natural, physiological, and even orgasmic birth if they remove the blockages and the programming and whatever that they've been saddled with to, you know, come back to their own innate knowing. So what do you think? So let's, okay, let's go into this idea of birth rape. So when you use this term, then what, what does that mean? Like, what's the line between a woman who's in the hospital receiving care versus birth rape? What's the difference there? Mm -hmm. Well, I'd like to even just remove, you know, the word birth in front of it, because I think even mm. that does a disservice to yeah. the seriousness of this. You know, it's, it's, we don't call it bar rape, you know, or bathroom rape yeah. if you're raped in the bathroom or the bar. So, um, yes, it's not a penis, you know, that, that is, um, that women are emerging, having a, the experience of rape from when we're talking about it happening in her birth experience, it's instruments, it's hands, um, you know, it's fingers, it's, it's all of that. But if the definition, which it is, is, um, you know, anything basically being inserted into a body uh, without consent, right? So 
that's like the FBI definition of it is anything being inserted into, um, uh, uh, I think the actual, whatever, it doesn't matter. It's something exact. It's something like that. It might actually specifically say genitals. Um, so, you know, if we, if we look at that and then we look at the coercion and the, uh, the expected vaginal exams, the, um, uh, that you don't get an opportunity to say no, um, Okay, so there's a spectrum. So I'm gonna say the more hardcore spectrum first. So I have been to countless births where the woman is asleep on an epidural and uh, she is woken up by, this has only happened with male doctors also, by the way, in my experience, uh, woken up receiving an aggressive vaginal exam in her freaking sleep, okay? Um, I have been to many births where it's an accidental birth at home. So they transfer, you know, they're being a good girl. They're still going to the hospital um, and they're punished, you know, with instruments and with hands. Um, there's a real, you know, some of this stuff's almost like you might not believe it if you haven't been there. One of the last hospital births I attended was, uh, oh, it was so brutal. And there was a woman next to me. It wasn't the woman I was with. There was a woman next to me in triage screaming no, screaming no. You know, there's a curtain between us, screaming no, that she didn't want an exam. She didn't want an exam. She just needed some time. And I poked my head in because I was right there. It was triage, so it's all like curtains. And um, there were four staff members holding her down with a fifth look like a resident, you know, at her yoni, shoving his hands inside of her while they held her down. So these are not unique experiences. And I want to make that very, very clear. I have seen, and, and you know, when you start talking to other birth workers, um, this is not unique to just me seeing this. Um, it's, it, it, it's quite common, actually. So this is more on the uh, extreme side, you know, of, of literally women being held down, screaming no, being screamed in their faces while things are inserted into their body. Um, it's also occasionally anal rape as well. You know, sometimes there's providers who um, without without consent or, or with good reason will also do a very deep and, and violent anal exam after a birth as well. Um, so those are more hardcore ones where it's like, okay, shit, well, I can see your point there. You're being held down and screaming. So, okay, yes. But then there's the spectrum where, as we know that there is, you know, in the same with women experiencing rape, you know, when you don't feel like you can say no, right? When you don't feel like you want it, but there's an expectation to do it and you don't feel safe um, and something is being, is coming into your body that you don't feel like you can get out of, um, you know, I mean, all, uh, uh, probably most women listening to this can go back to some experience in their younger years where this happened to them. Um, you know, and the, the, the story, the narrative, the, uh, the conversation about rape and consent, you know, has changed a lot since we were little girls, you know, it used to be this mm -hmm. idea of a stranger, you right. know, in the alley, and, and it's not. And actually, those kind of assaults are actually much more rare than the more common, uh, you know, rape and assaults and sexual, you know, molestation, which is um, somebody that you know, or someone that you even went, went, no, you know, went on a date with, and then it turns into something that's going way, way, way past your boundaries and don't feel like you can say no. Um, so I just want to apply that, you know, kind of layer that same framework onto a medical system uh, and then also, of course, we need to mention that vaginal exams are not necessary. They to, do not provide any uh, factual information that is going to help anything <laughs> about uh, the wellness and the, the natural um, unfolding of birth. Vaginal exams are helpful if you want to start pit, if you want a C-section, if you want to take over and sabotage a woman's birth. And yes, of course, it's a very quick way to discourage, control, assess, and diagnose, um, you know, things like a stall, which is not a real thing. Labors don't stall, um, you know, failure to progress, um, you know, all of these um, just really misogynistic uh, terms that have come up to convince us that um, we need to be saved from our birth experiences. So 
you know, maybe that answers it. You know, I, I know so many women who emerge from their medicalized births and they don't quite have the language for it. And they start explaining it and they say, I didn't have any control. You know, there was, there were forceps inside of me, or there was a speculum inside of me that the, the doctor went elbow deep to get the placenta out after 10 minutes. And I was screaming and no one was listening to me and I was saying no, or I wanted to say no on and on and on and on and on. But under this idea that, oh, well, it was in the hospital. So obviously it like saved your life, right? Like it was totally needed. So that's not rape, right? And so we have to be very careful internally how we are willing to make excuses for what's happening to women. Um, yeah. I don't know. I, I could talk about that a, for a long time. But. Well, I think that's the gray area that's really, or the pink, pink washed area that's really apparent these days is that people, there might be some dramatic instances and really obvious instances like you're talking about some of the examples you gave. And then I think there'd be a larger chunk of people who just, they don't really know what birth is all about. The somatic memory they have of birth is likely their mother having a similar experience in the hospital. So that's what they're carrying with them energetically, their own intervened with birth. And then they come into this space and they, they believe that these experts, have their best interest at heart, right? So these are the people who are supposed to be experts in this area, even, you know, again, like putting aside this notion that a woman has just devalued her own expertise, right? She thinks she's doing the right thing by listening to the experts and their guidance and their direction and doesn't feel like she would even have a say, right? That she would, you know, and so she might then walk out of her experience with kind of a mixed reaction, right? Like parts of her are feeling a little bit like, what just happened? And wow, that was intense. And that was a, a, you know, drama and a chaos. And oh, you know, we, since, so we know then in in the US, like 33% of women are getting C-sections. So some of these are women who get told (laughs) that they should schedule them for whatever reason, because the doctor doesn't want to be interrupted on a Saturday afternoon from his golf game. And so would rather, you know, schedule at 2 p.m. on a Thursday or, that they're in the procedure, in the process, in the hospital, the birth is going along, but then we, we see, we see, we know that the list of interventions lead towards C-section. So let's say the woman's given Pitocin and then she gets an epidural. You know, these things all lead to a higher chance of having a C-section because they stop the normal physiological hormonal process of birth. And so the woman then walks out with this story that she needed a C-section to save her life and save her baby's life. And so that's the the thing I think that women then becomes harder to unpack. And if we know that statistically, right, like in midwifery births, like at Anna Mae Gaskin's The Farm, they've got a C-section hospital transfer rate of 1.7%. So if we do the math- They used to. 31%. Yeah, not anymore, unfortunately. What's that? Not anymore, but they, they did for a time have that low of a before regulation and and before it got really big, they had a very, very, very low C-section rate. Okay. Got it. So, which is another topic I want to get into is like the constraints <laughs> yeah. that midwives have these days, even though they seem like a more moderate option. But so 30, let's just say then 31% of those births are non-emergencies, right? And so not emergency C-sections. And so what's the explanation, right? For all of these C-section births that just happen where there's like we said, some arbitrary, but I think it goes on to this larger theme of the idea that these, the medical establishment OBGYNs are controlling birth, right? So rather than, and this is like a larger spiritual discussion to me, like rather than, you know, historically over the millennia, women were seen as these magical, powerful creatures who had this incredible ability to give birth. They were looked at as the true shamans because they were the gatekeepers between the worlds, you know, between life and death. And then it seems like even some feminist scholars have written about this. There's been this resentment towards women for having this power, which was kind of the the impetus to move into more patriarchy. And anyway, but you see almost like the way that women are treated then in the birthing process is with disdain, with disrespect, with violence, without listening or honoring honoring the fact that they actually do know how to do this. And that seems to be the most rampant theme that's, you know, runs through all of this and whatever degree of that that's happened, you know, it'd be 
very, very rare to find an OBGYN who'd just say, look, I trust your body to do what it needs to do. I'll just be there on the sidelines or in the other room if you need me, <laughs> you know, like if something was to go wrong rather than, no, 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 this is my birth. I'm going to take charge of it. You just lay there, literally just lay there and I'll do the work. And it's actually, OBGYNs have very little to do with the birth. You know, they're, they're, phoning in and checking in with the nurse that's assigned to the room in every 12 hours that's changing over like no one's even there that's the other crazy part you know they're they're watching the monitors from the nurse's station you know and on a busy night one nurse might have a handful of rooms and she's watching all of the monitors and checking in when she can to do something you know medicalized um you know to to switch over the IV fluids or to up the pit or to um you know, ask how her epidural is feeling or, you know, to, to empty her catheter or whatever. But the, the doctor, you know, the hero who's going to come in and catch the baby, yeah. um, you know, they're, they're not even really a part of the whole thing uh, typically until the very, 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 very end. I have seen doctors get called in when the mom's pushing, doing uh, what they would call practice pushing, and maybe the head is starting to show, but it's not too much yet. And I've seen doctors literally walk in, roll their eyes in front of the woman, in front of all of us, roll their eyes and look at the nurse and said, I told you to call me when they're crowning. You know, so there's this real epic power play happening within the medical system, even on the floor. You know, the yeah. abuse of the, the nurses, that the nurses are freaking dehydrated on their feet for 12 hours with very little breaks, sometimes no breaks. Um, you know, the way that they're often talked to and treated, um, you know, I mean, if everyone's traumatized, you know, and then the, mm. the residency alone that doctors go through, it is so hardcore. It is so inhumane. What, what, you know, what our country is putting doctors through. Um, anyway, it's just, it's, uh, what's the word? It's unreasonable and unrealistic um, pressure and hazing um, so that by the time they're, you know, interacting with uh, female humans giving birth, you know, they've been so stripped away. Uh, I mean, man, my experience so often is I'm looking around and I'm like, you guys are like drones. Like, where is your energy? Where is your heart? Where is your, where's your eye contact? Like, this is, these are people and you can't even feel them a lot of the time because they're so shut down. Um, but anyway, I just totally went on a tangent, but yes, it's, it's, uh, you know, I was thinking about that when you were talking earlier about the mammals and how birth is meant to work. And, and yes, and, you know, how do we explain this gap of, of logic in this high C-section rate? And, you know, and every woman seems to emerge, not every woman, but many women seem to emerge from their C-sections, really believing that but they were the one. They were the one that really needed it. Yeah. And um, I'd love to address that quickly, which is, um, so... It's one thing to hear, okay, birth is meant to work and look at the animals. But when we say that to women in a, in a culture that's so deeply instinct injured and that feels so removed from animals, it's easy to not feel, first of all, that connection. Like, of course, a zebra can do it. They haven't been um, domesticated and, sure. and they're not yeah. as evolved and da, 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 right? It's easy to look for, for a means of separation. And what's interesting, when you said all animals can give birth, actually, domesticated animals have quite a hard time giving birth. And so it is interesting when we look at us who um, have become quite domesticated in many yeah. ways um, and, and, and with the... Uh, interference and, you know, if everything comes back to our mind, right? Everything comes back to um, what we believe. And if we believe that we can't give birth, it's going to be very difficult to give birth, right? If we believe, if we really believe that um, it's unsafe and that, you know, death is just around the corner at any, at every contraction and, um, you know, a, a doctor needs to be there and, and so forth, it's going to be very, um, very hard to open up and, and, and open up to the spiritual experience that is birth. Now, that doesn't mean it can't still happen, right? Like we know that accidental births at home happen all the time. We know 16-year-olds that didn't even know they were pregnant give birth, you know, in random places. Like we know that birth is a physiological experience, uh, but it depends on how much, you know, trauma and layers there are. I think we can't deny that it's, it's one thing to kind of know it in our neocortex, you know, but to make sense of it in this very complicated 
uh, kind of brainwashed state that says, you know, that says, you know, your first birth, you almost died and you hemorrhaged and thank God you were there to get that blood transfusion. And it's going to be very hard for that woman to overcome that. Um, and she has a lot of unpacking and critiquing and healing to do so that she can birth in power. And that's a lot of what I do. You know, I, I do a lot of sessions with women to unpack their stories. So they bring their birth story to me and they tell it to me as, as, as is true for them. And we just break it down. And, and I'm able to kind of fill in some gaps of where they might. Um, and it can be incredibly helpful uh, to, to get an understanding that what happened to you was not unique, right? Because, and this is another genius to how this whole thing goes down. We don't talk about birth. We don't see birth. And then you get pregnant and you get taken into an isolated room with a bunch of strangers. They do their thing on you. You know, hopefully you go home with a healthy baby and then it's done, right? So it's so compartmentalized that women aren't talking about it enough. Obviously, that's why we have these platforms to talk about it. But when women start to gather and they start to circle, which, you know, in my opinion, is like the answer to crushing patriarchy is just women need to gather. Women need to be in female only spaces and they need to talk because what happens in those spaces is everything starts to get discovered and uncovered. Um, and women sit around sharing their stories and go, oh my God, that happened to me too. Wait, they did that to me too. Wait a minute. Then maybe I didn't need that. Maybe that happened to me, you know, and it, it's, it's so beautiful, you know, because women are very smart. And when women gather, um, it's not hard to put the pieces together, but it's easy to keep us isolated and depressed and feeling broken, um, living these isolated lives that we live where, where our birth experiences are so, so, so compartmentalized in our lives. Well, it's similar to sexuality where I say, you know, like I said, that women, I say that everyone has these sexual abilities. Everyone is naturally voracious and is in touch with their sexuality underneath all of the blockages and conditioning that lays over top of that. And I'd say birth is exactly the same, right? We all have this innate ability, but we grow up watching TV shows where, you know, women are in the hospital screaming at the top of their lungs. And of course, the male doctor comes running in to save her life. And, you know, so these are imprinted upon people from as early on as they can remember. So, I mean, so let's and I address. Wanna honor, I, I want to honor the women who are listening to this and going, you know, fuck you guys. I really did need that C-section <laughs> or, you know, that are really feeling, um, uh, you know, feeling triggered by, by what we're, we're talking about. And, and I guess I just, I want to, um, let you know that this is stuff that once you start unpacking it and you get to the truth of it, I understand that it can feel really scary because what happens on the other side of that is that we start to take responsibility and that we start to question and that can be so flippin' painful. And to sit with the possibility that your C-section wasn't necessary or that your baby's first two weeks in the hospital and nick you away from you was part of this systemic, you know, uh, strategy and not, not about you and the baby. Um, that's, that's like one of the most gutting things, you know, to sit with that, that, um, uh, didn't need to happen. Now, of course, there's probably some person where a C-section did save their lives, but like Kim said, if we know that it should be around less than 2%, um, the courage to sit with that and to consider that, I assure you, what's on the other side of that is freedom and power. But if you need that story to survive, if you need the story that you needed that C-section or you needed that induction, I guess I would challenge you um, to really sit with why you need that story and what that story gives you. And you might find a lot of, um, a lot of fruit in that. That's really lovely. Thank you for saying that. And, you know, my whole philosophy in my work is all about radical self-responsibility. And when we take responsibility for things, we have power. And I, you know, I certainly never blame people for believing the so-called experts who tell them certain things and are perpetuating certain ideas. And it's just that when you start to be given 
glimpses of a possible other truth or possible other reality, then we have the choice to dive into that and see. And you can't, you know, fault yourself for believing, like I said, someone who was meant to be an expert telling you something. And but when you start to get glimpses of the truth, then the onus does fall on you to start, you know, going in that direction, and that there are gifts on the other side of that. So let's talk about midwifery currently in the U.S. So tell me what is the issue these days? <laughs> She's like <laughs> big sigh <laughs> yes. with with licensed midwifery today. So this isn't to say that there aren't wonderful midwives out there, but midwifery is not what it once was. And if these people are licensed and beholden to the medical system, can they really provide this level of care that does honor the physiological birth process? Or I, you know, my sense is that they're very constrained by certain limits that just force them to then comply with the greater system at large. So let me know what's your perspective yeah. on that. Yeah, so I guess I want to take it back a little further to say I have yet to see and study um, any any historical uh, midwifery that I thought was utopian, and that was it. You know, I really haven't um, anywhere where I have learned about midwifery. Uh, there's quite a bit of well, there's kind of this cycle of. Uh, women serving women and then patriarchy, you know, getting involved and wanting to, uh, even before this, this most recent round in America, you know, wanting to control uh, witch hunt, you know, all of that. And then classic and witch hunt style, and women turn on each other and go, no, no, burn her, not me. And so then they separate. Um, and then the women who are serving women, but who are capitulating to the system now start to sabotage birth. So we've seen this cycle again and again and again and again and again in history. So the most recent iteration of that, and, and let's take our, you know, America of the last hundred years. Um, yes, midwives were attending births and there was with, without regulations, there was much more uh, freedom and possibility of authentic midwifery, but we also can see many spaces where midwifery uh, was still totally um, brutal and and sabotage and and trying out these weird instruments and um, and often male driven as well. You know, a lot of a lot of males were calling themselves midwives before we got into the hospital. So it's kind of a weird. The whole thing about midwifery is always interesting to me because I think it's easy to paint this idea. Um, that it was like so beautiful and kumbaya and then insert, you know, insert the doc the doctor and everything changes. And I don't think it's quite that clean as I've looked into it. Um, but it's a, kind of a nice vision. Uh, anyway, so what, what has, what has happened over the last hundred years in, in this country is women were serving women. And there was, you know, like, like what's probably already in all of your minds, there was traditional women in communities that were just kind of known to be the women that served women in birth. Um, typically these, these midwives were serving, you know, this term is from womb to tomb, you know, they were serving the women of their community, um, for all, you know, through all of their blood mysteries. And, um, and they were uh, kind of just like an integrated part of a community. You know, it wasn't, um, I don't know, it just doesn't seem like it was that big of a deal. And with the, with birth getting co-opted and, and taken into the hospital um, in the 20s into the 30s with the male physicians coming over from the UK and um, really looking for ways to uh, get more business in the hospital, because this was all still a pretty new thing, um, they did a very successful, very wide scale propaganda uh, campaign against midwives. And you can still find this stuff today online. You know, it'll be these like posters of, of a wart faced, you know, old hag with a, with a rum bottle, you know, on one <laughs> side, it's just so absurd. And then on the other side is a white guy in a, in a, in a lab coat, you know, and it's like, who do you want to have be at the birth of your child? You know, it's just so absurd. And so, um, there was a very successful propaganda campaign and, um, it's Much like massive today. history. Anyway. Yeah, exactly. I mean, and it's, it's, it's quite complex. It's actually very interesting, but, um, I'm just going to kind of uh, go through it. So with midwifery, what happened was, um, and I'm, I'm by no means an expert, but my understanding is that um, as doctors, as, you know, OBs started to co-op uh, co birth and want it in the hospital, um, it was quite obvious that they needed to, um, they needed to 
get rid of midwives, right? Because everyone was birthing with midwives and home birth was normal. And so they both did these campaigns and then they also started to regulate. And so it, it essentially, and this happened all over Canada, I mean, this has really happened all over the world, but essentially, uh, you know, the government has gotten involved, um, which of course is totally a brother to the medical paradigm and has said, uh, you know, capitulate to the system or we're going to put your ass in jail, you know? So, okay, so what are these women to do? Um, there have been times in our history, like in the seventies when, when, you know, Ina May's, Ina May and her, and her sisters, you know, participated in this beautiful uprising of midwifery. And then, um, these organizations started to come around and in the seventies and then into the eighties, there was a real sense of, uh, and I know this because of the elder midwives I know who have told me these stories, there was a real sense that perhaps something, um, really beautiful could happen within, uh, the medical model really acknowledging midwifery and giving them a place in our above ground system. Sadly, that's not how the story goes. And um, the rules and regulations are oh, so disheartening. Um, let me back up. Let me just give a quick overview. So licensed midwifery is the only legal way to practice um, midwifery in America and in Canada. And what that means is that you have um, agreed, you know, you've, you've sat for the licensure, you've attended a school, and you have paid money towards this, and you agree to uphold the rules and regulations of your state. So there are some common rules and regs that kind of go across all the states, um, and then each state has their own, uh, you know, little, little nuances to them, more specific rules. So... Um, you know, you might be thinking, well, what's wrong with that? Of course, those rules and regulations are there to keep us safe. And of course, not every birth you know, would, would stay safe at home. And isn't this just helping us have um, some parameters to have healthy and safe births? And I wish that were the case. Um, but sadly, that's not the case. And it, it creates a environment where a midwife is unable to provide individualized care. And so some of the rules and regulations are actually quite significant. Um, and so some quick examples of that are... Um, I'm most well-versed with California because that's where I'm from. But like I said, a lot of these go for all the states where there is, you know, midwifery is not actually legal in all, all of the states, um, but where they are legal. Um, so a midwife, a licensed midwife cannot attend a birth at home uh, if, the, if, the, if the mother is before 37 weeks gestation or after 42 weeks. So many, 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 many women are still pregnant at 42 weeks. However, if a midwife, uh, you know, wants to honor her licensure, um, she has to abandon care at 42 weeks. So a really simple example of what happens there, and it's a very common story, is around 40 weeks, the midwife starts bringing up sweeping the membranes, um, air quotes again, natural inductions, no such thing, uh, you know, castor oil, which is toxic and incredibly dangerous. Um, and so in the midwife's perspective, from what I've gathered of many, many, many midwives I worked for and, and, and studied under um, is, well, it's better to, it's better to, you know, do what we can because they don't want a hospital birth. And so let's get things going and try to work within the parameters of, of our rules and regulations. But very simply put, you know, what that creates is sabotage. So a birth, you know, process is not meant to be rushed. Um, and it can be incredibly dangerous to rush a birth process. So, you know, women, you know, midwives have women taking all these tinctures and herbs, which are actually quite powerful, or sweeping their membranes, which can very easily break the membranes with the water bag. Um, and then, you know, castor oil, like I said, which can easily cause diarrhea and um, dehydration. And it's just such a brutal, brutal example. So that happens all the time. Another one might be breach. You know, if the baby's in bum position, the midwife um, has to abandon care. Mm -hmm. uh, twins, um, you know, if the waters have been open for uh, over 12 to 24 hours, um, it's without significant, pro you know, progress of labor, it's expected that you'll transfer. In some places, going back to birth rape, in Arizona, and I believe it's Arkansas, you are expected to give a vaginal exam to your client every hour of their labor process. That's disgusting, um, and they're not they're not legally allowed to decline. So there's there's a lot to this. There's a lot of examples, um, but pretty so, serious ones. And so I guess what I want to bring together is that it's not mother led. If a mother says I want to birth at home, and I'm comfortable 
being pregnant at 42 and a half. I still want a birth at home or I'm comfortable with my baby being bum first. It doesn't matter. The midwife, because she is first and foremost beholden to the system, which, you know, we can't forget who created the rules and regs of the system. Mm -hmm. It wasn't midwives, Mm -hmm. right? It was doctors and, 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 you know, high, high male authorities. Uh, Got it. Yeah. So it's, it's, the, the, the thing I always say is that a licensed midwife has to betray somebody and what a terrible position to be in. Right. So they're either going to betray themselves, the mother, or the system that they have bought into saying that they're going to uphold. Right. You know, they have to betray somebody. You know, even the NRP regulations when a baby's born, you know, the midwife getting involved and assessing the baby, like what that does for mother baby that the mother's not assessing, that the mother's not the first one to hear the heart and to, uh, you know, touch their face or look in their eyes. My God. That's right. very serious. Yeah. Yeah. So let's sweep over then to free birth. And so we've explored what the opposite of free birth looks like to some degree. And tell me about the power and the magic, the empowerment of free birthing and some of the most positive experiences you've seen and what that does for a woman. So this is one of the major things that I think women just have no idea what's waiting for them is this gift. You know, like, like, let's say right now, it's really trendy to go do ayahuasca and go on this big vision quest and like, you know, get to know yourself. It's like, um, as a woman, you have, you know, a lot of these ceremonies were invented in tribal cultures for men. You know why? Because they didn't have birth. They didn't have menstruation and they didn't have birth as these allies to use to access these other dimensions and states of consciousness. And so I think what women are completely clueless about is it's like, well, it's no big deal. Like I'm fine. The baby's fine. Like whatever. Yet they're missing out on this magnificent, humongous spiritual rebirth opportunity and one that really shapes them as a mother going forward into the rest of their lives. So if you could speak to that and then how free birthing supports this and, you know, the gift of free birthing for women and for their babies. Yeah. I mean, well, the first thing, as you say, that makes me think of is, you know, obviously sex. And so if you're having, you know, kind of meh sex and it's maybe five minutes long and, you know, the guy comes and so it's over and, you know, maybe you guys cuddle or kiss and it's just kind of, eh, you know, or if you've only away fast sex, junk food sex, I call it. I was just going to say junk food. If you've only ever had junk food and you've only eaten at McDonald's, you know, and it's like, oh, you just have like your favorite thing there and it's fine, you know, and if you've only ever had hospital births, um, you know, you you could probably emerge from some of them feeling like, oh, that was a pretty good birth. Um, And comparatively speaking, like that 10 minute sex we had last week was so great compared to the five minute sex we usually have. Right, right, right. Exactly. So it's accepting crumbs, right? Which is what patriarchy asks us to do as women, you know, in general. And so, um, you know, so then obviously going to, you have the most epic lovemaking with a consensual, powerful partner and, you know, you experience female orgasm for the first time and, you know, it's going on for two hours and you're feeling worshipped and opened up in a whole new way and, you know, holy shit, you know, that's a whole new world. Or if you've been eating McDonald's and then you get to eat this local, homemade, gorgeous, healthy, prepared food, you know, you, you're opening up in a whole new way. And then obviously with birth, it's, it's the same thing that you just spoke to. So, um, yeah. So, I I also want to say before I dive into this that free birth is not necessarily the gold standard. And I don't want to come off like that is what I think. Free birth is just birth uninterrupted. You know, free birth is birth without disrespect. Free birth is just birth. And so it's, I I guess why I want to say it's not the gold standard is that if, 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 you know, if you want to have women there, if you want to hire a doula, if you want to hire a midwife that you love, um, that's not less than, you know, the gold standard to my mind is that you emerge from your birth feeling totally respected and totally um, intuitive and, and totally, um, yeah, seen and, and, and revered, right? And so, and that you don't have any interruption, you know, an undisturbed birth. I guess you could argue that an undisturbed birth is a gold is the gold standard from a mammalian biological standpoint. 
and it's hard to achieve an undisturbed birth. Uh, well, I will say it's impossible to achieve if you leave your home. It's, it's absolutely impossible. You can't have an undisturbed birth if you leave your nest, if you leave your den, you disturb it. It's just objectively true. Like your hormones will shift, you'll go into adrenaline, it's just true. Um, and so, you know, it has, to, it has to occur in your nest, in your den, at home. Um, but who arrives is still um, a huge component of if it's going to be undisturbed or not. Um, so, yes, yeah, so free birth. You know, free birth, kind of on that same note, free birth is, is to my mind, the most logical way to protect the optimal setting to have an undisturbed birth, right? So all we can do is set it up and hold intention for it. And then the rest is up to, you know, the divine and up to your baby and up to uh, your environment. So what are the things we can control? We can control who's there, right? That's extremely important because the one wrong person can screw the whole thing up because you are the most sensitive and the most, um, primal, you know, and the most sensitive and the most psychic that, that you really can be. And, you know, you brought up ayahuasca, like my, I had a very long birth. It was 52 hours and I was totally on ayahuasca. I wasn't actually, I was sober, but I, you know, I was fully tripping and I was, it wasn't all cosmic butterflies either. I was doing some deep, deep, deep underground underworld, um, you know, psychedelic shit down there. Um, but you know, that stuff wouldn't have been able to happen if I had gone, um, and birthed elsewhere, right. I wouldn't have been able to get into the space and feel the level of safety that I was able to feel, um, to open up and have the psychedelic and euphoric experience that I had, which then carried on for a very long time after my daughter was born. You know, I felt like I was tripping in on ecstasy for many, 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 many days after my birth. Um, and thank God I only had to stay in bed and didn't have to like put her in a car seat and get her home or navigate the world in any way so that I was able to stay in this, um, truly, uh, euphoric bubble. So, I mean, I, I've, like I said before, I've seen a lot of births. I've seen them in all settings. Um, I have attended births that didn't have medical management. I don't know if I could call them free births cause I was there and I am undeniably a bit of an authority in all of this. So doesn't really matter uh, to my mind, like how we label it, but I've certainly seen an undisturbed birth. And there is no question that once you've experienced that, I mean, I've had women look up at me, you know, holding their baby with blood dripping down their, you know, their legs and their milk starting to come in and they're standing in the tub in the middle of their home and look up at me, having just caught their own baby and having had not one person um, intervene and, you know, look up and said, I had no idea, you know, I had no idea. I thought my last births were great. I had no idea that it was like this, you know, and it's just so, it's one of those things that, you know, you, you can't access it until you walk through it. And so my passion and my, um, you know, the love I have for women and for families and for this earth is to help protect that sacred space so that women can access that. Um, because when a woman accesses that, whew, everything changes. So one of my favorite stories is uh, uh, one of the first undisturbed births I saw was a woman who had been uh, very anorexic and very self-sabotaging her whole life. She'd been a dancer and um, bulimic, and oof, it was it was really hard for her to be pregnant. You know, it was really hard for her to gain weight. Um, even though she knew it was her baby and she was really trying to lean into the work. She was really trying, oh, it always makes me emotional remembering her. She was really trying to, um, yeah, do her, do her work so that she could show up for this child. And this was a very wanted child, but it was very confronting for her and her body image. So she births and, um, has an incredible birth, births at home with her husband and me and, um, uh, it was her sister and, it was actually a pretty simple birth. It wasn't that long either. Anyway, so then the next day I leave, you know, they get settled. They go, I, I go home and I see them the next day and she's still kind of just in her blissful bubble. And then the next day I didn't visit her that day and she called me and she called me sobbing. And, you know, in my head, I'm like, oh shit, what's wrong? What happened? And she said, no, 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 I'm okay. And she's crying. And she finally says, it gives me butterflies remembering this. She said she, I should also paint the picture. She has a bedroom where it has those sliding glass mirrored doors 
Mm -hmm. Um, so when you're in the bed, you can see your mirror, you know, the mirrors are like half of the room. It's like the whole wall. Anyway. So she said, you know, I got out of bed this morning and my pad had leaked and I had blood coming down my thighs and I caught the glimpse of myself in the mirror and my breasts are engorged and my hair is crazy. And I haven't even showered since the birth and I have blood all over. And in that moment I was healed. And she really was. And she began to love food. She began to love her body. And, you know, when I saw her months later, she was like a different person. And it was all born from this rite of passage being honored, loved, respected, seen, validated in safety. Whatever stuff she had come into this world with truly did get healed. And what a gift she was able to give her child, you know, in that and and to her whole family and to herself. So, you know, that's that's kind of like a a perfect example of what is possible. I've seen it heal relationships. I just want to say that's so beautiful. That also got me choked up listening to that. I was like, oh, that's (sighs) so wow. Amazing. You know, and you, you wouldn't, if I had told her months before, oh girl, on day three, you're going to look at the blood coming down your (laughs) legs and your boobs engorged. And you know, you won't have showered in four days and you're just going to love yourself. She would have been like, you're high. Like there's, it wouldn't, it wouldn't have made any sense, Mm -hmm. you know, but the Mm -hmm. fact that she, you know, went, went where she needed to go and did her work and brought the spirit and the body of her child here and that her body, this thing that she has hated yeah, her whole dissociated life. Dissociated from, yeah. Right. Dissociated from and just hurt that all of a sudden that was the vessel that gave her this beautiful creation. Boom. You know, and, and that just can't happen in the same way if you are being drugged, and examined and diagnosed with strangers around and being told what to do and limited in your options. And, you know, it just, it just can't happen, you know? And so it's, it's, it's beautiful. It's beautiful. And it's also very painful, right? Because this is a rare occurrence where a Tell woman me another is one. Do you have another one? I want to hear another <laughs> one of my, one. one of my favorites recently <laughs> with the podcast was, um, yeah, I mean, I have, I thankfully have nonstop options to tell you about these. Um, this one woman, it's not as emotional, but it's totally just as beautiful. Um, she was on the podcast, I think, last season. She lives in uh, South Africa, and she, with her first birth, she was uh, brutally cut and received a fourth degree cut for an episiotomy that that cut to her anus, and um, you know, very ugh, just the worst, and you know, very challenging recovery, and um, just very brutal, and it didn't properly heal, didn't it didn't really ever get quite right. And so when she was pregnant with her second child, she went to uh, some doctors to talk about, you know, having her birth with them. And every single doctor said, oh, no, we're not, there's no way with the tear that you had. And and I, you know, it's important to say that wasn't a tear. That was a freaking cut that happened to her. That was not a spontaneous, naturally occurring cut. Um, I mean, tear, it was a cut. So uh, she couldn't find an OBGYN to wow. attend her. All of them said C-section. It's going to be a C-section. And she didn't have many options. She was in a small town. And so she gets into her car and she was by herself that day. And her, her husband was home with the, her son. And, you know, she just is just um, devastated and still believing the thought that she needs attendance, right? Because she she didn't know. She'd never given it, been given any options. And uh, for some reason, I guess the story goes that she went on Instagram and she found my page and it was like in one of those, you know, like maybe you'll like this options. Oh, yeah. And I, I guess one of my episodes had just come out. So long story short, she finds the ep- the podcast. She starts listening to it. Some rural, rural town in South Africa finds um, the the podcast, falls in love with it, and she emails me right around the time that I birthed my daughter. She emailed me that she. Um, had just birthed on a bear skin, birthed her second son with only her older son and her husband on a bear skin in front of their fire and was writing to thank me. And, you know, like it's, this is it. Like this is it because now that, I mean, I've seen women leave their abusive husbands after they birth in power. I've seen, I've known, you know, women who wear burqas, you know, very, 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 you know, oppressive uh, religious, um, you know, um, 
they, like this one woman used to be in our group who was from um, a Muslim country in war burqa and and I mean there's a lot there you know and had a really traumatic birth uh, with her first and she just secretly stayed home and free birthed you know and it, and it shifted everything internally for her so I guess all of these are to say and I have countless stories like this um, you know including my own and and what it does for us um, to access and feel our own power in a world that very actively um, doesn't want us to <laughs> you know all of these all of these internalized uh, beliefs start to fall away and what happens inside of that is I mean the the ability to see women as my sisters has is a huge piece to this like uh, that, that not believing the lie of patriarchy and horizontal violence that we're competitors you know that has been a huge thing and experiencing a wild pregnancy and experiencing my free birth and walking through the, those gates and and seeing every woman on this planet as my sister in all of this you know that was born from um, my experiences of power and you know and, and that's also something that many women say you know, there's just these certain these these systems that separate us just kind of fall away inside of us um, and the willingness like I stopped shaving you know that's a big deal I stop wearing makeup that's a big deal like these things have are happening inside of me um, that feels so good. And that's the guide, right? Like what feels good and what feels authentic and what feels powerful. And, you know, women are doing that. They're doing it in their own ways all over the world. They're doing it without the permission of their husbands. They're doing it um, even against, you know, a lot of uh, lack of support. It doesn't matter because a baby will come. You know, this a woman has to contend with the reality that a baby will come. And so, um, it's it's an opportunity to take some real responsibility around it and to realize you have a choice um, and so what choice are you going to make you know we are so taught to live in victim consciousness and we are so we are so taught that things happen to us and that we have no power but when you start to um, realize and consider that things happen through us and for us you know everything starts to shift and the real fun is when you start to realize everything you're doing is a choice and it's a choice you're making. So if you want to go to the hospital to birth, own it, own it, you know, know that you wanted to do it, own that you want to do it. It really learn what it is and embody that choice. Um, you know, what I have seen again and again in my work is that women, when they come to really understand what the hospital has to offer, um, it's not a choice that's very interesting to them because it's a choice usually based in fear, rooted in a lie that you're broken, you're an emergency waiting to happen, and the strangers over there can save you. And so um, that's not true. You're not broken. You know, nobody knows you better than you know yourself. And, you know, birthing with strangers is act is actually objectively harmful, mm -hmm. <laughs> right? Because it yeah. gets us out of our oxytocin and beta endorphins and prolactin yeah. that are, you know, meant to be being released. So for people who are hearing this and they're, maybe these are new ideas to them or they've, you know, kind of heard echoes of this, like what would you say some of the steps are for them to start moving in the direction from where they thought they needed to be to where they might possibly go to? Yeah. Well, I love the podcast we do because it's all women's personal narratives of birthing and power. So it's a really cool way to learn um, because there's no agenda to it. It's not like a course or a book, which we also have those if you want to do deep dives. Um, I was just going to say but, your podcast is yeah. fantastic. I've listened to it and there's stories of women in their free birthing experiences. And some of these women, most, well, at least most of the ones I'd listened to, it often had a first birth that was less than ideal. And so that tweaked something in them to be like, hmm, maybe this could be done another way. And that led to the, often their next experience as being a free birth. And so mm -hmm. to hear that evolution and then just hear women's play by play of how it happened, it's so powerful. Like, you know, we talk about the power of storytelling that before we had all the means that we have in this day and age, that was our principal way of learning, right? Is storytelling or oral right. history, oral history. And um, 
you, I think like you revived that in your podcast mm-hmm. because they're these beautiful, vulnerable, real stories. And once you hear them, you can't help but be transformed because this is the truth coming out of the mouths of babes and the mouths of vaginas, like right there for you. Exactly. Exactly. And that's the thing, right? Women own birth. And so these are women's stories. I don't want experts on. I don't want men on. I don't want... Um, you know, a lot of stuff on there. I'm very specific about the space that I wanted to carve out was women's personal stories because those are inarguable, right? And so that, like you said, with oral tradition, and and I believe that women do learn best through personal narrative. I certainly know I do. And I've birthed, you know, I've I've attended so many women in birth and they're not going to be like, didn't you tell me 20% of first time moms, you know, their water's open before labor significantly starts 24 hours later. They're not going to say that. But if I had told them a story about a woman, you know, last year whose water's opened and her labor didn't start for three days. And then that happens to her, she's going to remember her, Mm -hmm. you know? And so knowing that and taking that. uh, Yeah. And so I, I love the podcasts and it's, you know, it's a free resource. It's an easy place to start. Um, and then, I mean, if you're really digging this, we have a private community. Uh, we have, I bought a proprietary network that's a safe space online, which is almost an oxymoron, but I'm very proud of what we've created. And um, you can, it's very vetted. And so there's a fee associated to it and you have an interview and you sign non-disclosure agreements. Um, but so, you know, all the women in there really want to be there. And it's a very high integrity space of um, women of all ages. And so that's definitely for the community aspect. And then we are coming out with our first book that Yolanda wrote uh, by the end of this year. And then we have courses. Um, We have the complete guide to free birth, which is enormous. And um, I mean, that's like everything we think you need to know and it's video based and it's awesome. Um, So yeah, there's a lot of ways to engage with it, but I think if you're new to this and you just want to kind of poke your toe in, I think the, the podcast is a really easy place to start mm-hmm. because you what feels yeah. appealing I mean, to it's you. just like when you hear the women telling their stories and obviously they're telling the truth that you, and then you go along this journey with them, you cannot help but be shifted and inspired by it. And, you know, it really comes down to all of the fear that's bred around the process of birth and then releasing that. And I think hearing these women go through it and sharing and, you know, all the nuances and different directions their stories go and all of them are also unique and interesting that, like I said, you cannot help but be shifted, right? To know, all right, so it can be, it can be done a completely different way. Everything that I've been told and seen about birth is one version, one manufactured version, and here's another. And it totally goes against the, it it fixes the false narrative in our minds that women who do, who choose to birth unassisted are irresponsible and selfish and that they're putting themselves at harm. And, you know, all all of this just ridiculous, uh, misogynistic, you know, rhetoric in our, in our society. I mean, I always say that free birth is the feminist's like last frontier because Mm. you'll even find, you know, feminists or reproductive justice, you know women who are still like, oh yeah, but you go to the hospital, <laughs> you know, who are like, or go on the birth for, control pill. Oh. yeah, exactly. Exactly. So it's, uh, it's, it's, it really been quite interesting to be one of the leaders of this, of this movement online and, 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 and offline, um, and see the vilification, you know, that the vil, vil, villainine, is that the right word of, of how quick, you know, people are to, um, to, <sighs> just throw women under the bus. And, and, you know, what I always come back to is you either trust women or you don't trust women. So if you trust women, you get out of their business. Right. And if you don't trust women, you're going to think that you're like, that there's a heroic need to be in their business. Right. Which you can easily see play out with the abortion, you know, conversation, but again, with the free birth conversation as well. So trust women, center women, and let them mother their own children, right? So women are ready. Women want self-authority. Women, women want to, uh, mother in their instinct. You know, women are ready to listen and, and bind together and be in community and share these stories. Women are so, so, so ready for it. And so we're doing it. 
Fantastic. Well, thank you so much for being here and we'll put resources to your information along with this. And yeah, I really salute what you're doing in the world and it's wonderful to have you out there fighting the good fight. <laughs> Thanks, sister. I can't wait to meet you. Here's Hannah. As I said before, Hannah free birthed her first child with just she and her partner and a close friend in her home in a bathtub outside. Her story is magnificent in that she truly tuned in every step of the way to ask for, listen to, and honor her body and higher guidance of how to birth her baby. From being guided to create and sing a song, which became her mantra during the birth, to going on a meditation retreat shortly before her child was born to connect even more deeply with herself. Hannah did the work and reaped the rewards. Here is her official introduction. Hannah Grace is a young woman following her innate and primal wisdom in all avenues of her existence. She lives life rooted in her power and is devoted to mothering wildly and intuitively. She birthed her first child a year ago in ecstasy and bliss, unhindered and medically unassisted. Her free birth experience continues to heal her and her ancestors in profound ways. Hannah Grace, her partner and child, live a love-centered life, prioritizing wellness and intimate connection with each other. You can learn more about Hannah Grace by following her on Instagram, where she shares about her motherhood journey, eco-friendly living, nutritious recipes, and more. We'll post links to her Instagram in the show notes, which you can find on my website. Hannah shares how the stories that she was told about birth were pretty negative. Her mother had birthed her and her sister through C-sections that were fraught with stress and trauma. Hannah worked through this imprinting determined to do things differently and she did. Welcome Hannah. Hi, thank you Kim. So great to have you here. Thank you for coming on the show to talk about your birth experience. Yeah, my pleasure. So you had a, what's termed a free birth and you had it outdoors, which I totally love. So I want you to talk to us about when did you learn about the idea of free birthing and was it something that you wanted to do before you became pregnant or was it a decision that you made during your pregnancy? I learned about free birth at a woman's gathering um, around a fire uh, a woman I met there, Alexandra, who's now a friend of mine, told the story of her birth of her son, Zion, that was, I think, about seven months before. And it was this amazing story of them in a yurt, in the snow. Um, and I just felt something in my body that was just like a yes. Like, that is how I want to give birth. Um, I wasn't yet pregnant um, for another two years. And once I became pregnant, um, I, I definitely knew deep down I wanted to free birth, but I still kind of played in the midwife world for a little while. Um, and then I, you know, I eventually realized that, well, I, I sought out a midwife because I wanted that like elder um, that wisdom and that love from an elder woman because I didn't really have anything like that in my life. So I went on seeing her and eventually I realized that it was still in the medical paradigm and it was still going to be a managed birth. And there wasn't really that, that elder role that I was looking for. So I returned back to my heart's knowing that I would um, give birth freely without any medical professional around. Yeah. Beautiful. I love it. I love you listening to your inner guidance. So what kind of birth stories did you hear growing up? Like was this, it sounds like obviously the idea of free birthing was new to you, but was the idea of even home birth something that was on your radar as a child, you know, as you were growing up, or is that something you kind of came into as an adult that you learned about? Yeah, it wasn't anything I'd ever heard. My mom had very medicalized births. And those, that was the main birth story I heard growing up was my sister's birth, who was a very traumatic uh, emergency cesarean. And so then I was a scheduled cesarean because my mom just couldn't handle that stress again of going into the hospital. And I'd never really heard of home birth. 
Uh, so I just grew up with, yeah, a pretty fearful birth story. My mom still has a lot of trauma from that. And that was also a big intention of mine going into having a free birth was healing my inherent trauma from my mother's birth in my birth, um, which is definitely part of my my life's work, I would say, is um, yeah, healing a lot of my mom's trauma and ancestors before her. Right, because the inherent wisdom and instinctual knowledge that's there for us then gets obscured through a generation or a couple generations before us of our mother's maybe, maybe not our grandmothers, but maybe at this point, depending on who's listening to this podcast, who would be um, in that category of having a medical, surgical, technological birth. So yeah, then the right. energy gets changed from what we know deep down to an altered version paradigm of that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I really didn't want to continue on the story anymore that my mom had, that she wasn't able to give birth. Uh, she wasn't able to have a vaginal birth was what she always believed. Right. So how did your partner feel about you choosing to have a free birth? Was he on board right from the beginning or did he take some convincing? Uh, he was pretty on board, but there were definitely still fears both of us had to face and really look at when knowing that that would be what we were going forward with. And... He very quickly was totally on board with me and supportive. Um, we both really like to live a primal, natural life. And that was what felt most normal. I love it. And so what about the people around you? Like, I'm assuming given your lifestyle, you probably had a lot of people who were supportive of this idea. But even then, this can hit a lot of because so many of us came out of these surgical birth stories, that it can hit a lot of nerves with people. And there's so much fear and propaganda about it. So what was the support like around you when people then learned of your decision? Yeah, um, you know, a few of my friends that I had told all my close friends were very supportive and happy for me. Uh, my family, on the other hand, I chose not to tell uh, until after because I knew it would bring up a lot of fears for them. And I just didn't really want that in my sphere when I was so pregnant and going into my birthing time. Um, we actually did tell my mother-in-law at one point, but she chose not to remember. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> so there was that. Um, yeah, but my friends were all very, very supportive, which was, which was really nice. And anyone who I already knew wouldn't be, I just didn't tell. Yeah. Smart. So, and so what was helpful for you to break through some of your own barriers? Like you mentioned that you had some fear, mm -hmm. your partner had some fear. Like how did you move through that to come to a place of being confident in that decision? A lot of just untangling of these fears and discovering what they were actually rooted in. Like where is that fear coming from? And a lot of them were from my mom and from my sister's birth specifically uh, I did end up going to a 10-day silent meditation course a couple of weeks before I gave birth and just dove in so deep that by the third day, everything was surfacing for me that I needed to look at. And it was easeful to sift through. It was like glowing and being so clear to me. I had these fears of, you know, having a nuchal cord, like the cord wrapped around the neck and birthing my baby and him not breathing. And um, that was definitely rooted in my, my sister's birth. That was something that happened with her. It was always a part of the story my mom told us. You know, she was a cesarean and the cord was around her neck and she almost died and blah, blah, blah. Um, things like that. It was just... Yeah, meditation and just going in and looking at th what things were super rooted in and journaling about all those things and talking about them with Tyler, like him and I being very clear and expressing our fears to one another and not hiding things. 
Beautiful. I love the conscious approach to that. And also how you're referring to birth stories, right? Like some of the stories that you were being told were negative. And so you're choosing to rewrite the story, which is fantastic. So let's dive into the story. So tell us how things unfolded for you in the course of your birth with your son. Okay. Um, I'd say I started having some pretty strong contractions off and on or sensations Um, uh, four days maybe prior to knowing I was really in the birth process. I was just with my friend Shay and we were kind of doing some last minute things, walking around and shopping and getting groceries. Uh, And then it came to two days before going into the birth process fully and I'm saying birth process rather than labor um it just feels better to me good do it uh yeah I had built a drum for my son because that was something that I had downloaded during the 10-day meditation course knowing that I would then write a song that would beckon him forward so I created my altar And I sat in our little 10 by 12 house that we lived in at the time by myself. And I just started drumming and I channeled the song to call him forth. And I sang it for a couple of hours. And then I went and had dinner with my best friend and my partner, Tyler. And then the three of us, let's see. No, that was the next night. Uh, then we went to bed, and the next morning I woke up, and uh, my cord had or my uh, mucus plug had come had come out. I went to go pee on the on the grass outside, and there I saw my mucus plug on the earth. And then I really knew things were were happening. I I had physical proof, I guess, <laughs> that mm-hmm. things were happening. Right. Um, we just spent the day normally. I didn't really like start to go into the mindset of oh, when's birth gonna happen. I just went on my day like normal, planted some flowers, I think we planted some bulbs, and we just had a nice day. In the evening, we walked all the way down the hill. We live on a hilltop, so we walked all the way down the bottom of the driveway, which just felt really good and symbolic, like just going downward, Mm. calling the baby down intentionally. I couldn't really at that point. I was so pregnant. And had a really nutritious dinner and then we went to sleep. I woke up probably around four in the morning and turned over to my husband and asked him to make love to me, knowing that it would most likely be the last time it was just he and I. Mm -hmm. Um, And that was really beautiful. And then we went back to sleep and he was holding me behind me. I woke up a couple hours later with really strong sensations moving through me. And I just had my hands on my belly, on my womb, keeping it warm. And I just breathed through them. And I I tried a few different things here. I like tried just intentionally breathing in and out. And then I tried counting the sensations, seeing how long they lasted. That didn't feel quite right to me. And so I chose to just be so present and fully experience the sensation as me and as my body. And it became so easy and so soothing. So around, I don't know, a couple hours later, my friend came over to our little house and we meditated together like we had been for the two two weeks prior to the birth all together. And the mantra came to me, I am peaceful and at ease. And that just felt so resonant in my body that that became my mantra for my birth. So as the sensations moved through me, that was just what came to my mind. I am peaceful and at ease. I am peaceful and at ease. Uh, They left me in the room alone. I went and walked outside quite a bit, just greeted all of our animals. Had some breakfast. Tyler left to go get some flowers to plant because I originally imagined I would be planting flowers in early labor. Uh, As soon as he left, I was in full-on birth experience like 
so strong. Everything was moving through me. I was holding on things outside and just moving my body however it felt right. I went into my room and Shay, my friend, had covered the window so it was dark in there. And I just really started like chanting and moving and grooving. I was practically twerking. I was holding on to my bed and the window with my ass up in the air, just jumping, 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 like jiggling my thighs and my butt, just moving. I had one leg back behind me, shaking it and doing this like, ah, uh, ah, uh, chant for, I don't know, three hours, fully in it, like not even, I had no other thoughts on my mind. I was just so present. The only thing that I would think of is I am peaceful and at ease. Yeah, I was so, so deep in the moment of this baby moving down through me and my body moving however which way it felt right. Uh, I wasn't doing any specific birthing position or doing something I had read in a book or anything like that. I was just letting my body do what it needed to do and knowing that my baby and me were in such deep communication and connection that everything I was doing was, was perfect. The only thing that would come onto my mind was I'm peaceful and at ease. And it eventually got to a point where I couldn't remember the words, but I felt the resonance through my body. And at some point I thought like, Oh, I wonder when Tyler will get here because this baby is coming. Yeah. And then I looked up and I saw him pull in the driveway and he came in or first he went and checked with Shay to see what was going on before coming into my space, being very intentional, all of us. So he went and, you know, checked in with Shay, came over to see me. I had him get down on his knees. We didn't speak, but I like just moved him to where I wanted him to be. And I used his shoulders as I was using the bed earlier and just continued my dance, jumping up and down and chanting. And he told me later he was just envisioning this strong, this heavy, heavy boulder, just being that like present masculine force, allowing you know, the feminine to move and flow and create and bring life forth. For, he was in there for maybe about 20 minutes, and then he asked me if he if I wanted him to set up the hot water heater so we could get hot water to the tub outside. And I said yes. I was definitely ready to be in the tub. So he left and went to go get that set up. And I continued my dance. Shay came in to join me. She would, I would say water. She would give me water with a straw. I would say toilet paper. She would give me toilet paper so I could wipe myself. Um, and that was it. She never offered me anything. She never spoke. She stayed behind me to where I didn't see her. And she was just kind of moving with me and dancing with me and moving the energy and just being that present, amazing person offering me whatever I had asked for. And then I moved into transition and I moved really low down to the floor. So I was on my knees, leaning on the stool my head against the stool and just tapping with my hands and my my once very strong chant had become this like low guttural sound in the same rhythm but just much deeper and lower resonance and I, I was in another world you know I when I looked around everything was incredibly like vibrant and mystical and cloudy like a dream and then I thought, oh, I really hope the tub is ready soon. And then I hear Tyler say, the tub is ready. <laughs> Do you want to come out? Everything was just, you know, so lined up. We were all so in sync. So I got up and I went out to the tub. I didn't realize that I'd be giving birth in the tub. I thought I would just go out there for a nice relaxing time uh, just to slow down everything and get a breather before moving into the last phase of birth. So I went out to the tub. I had some big sensations move through me. Tyler held me up. I leaned on him. 
And then all of a sudden I reached down and his head was already there. And I had, I was absolutely like, we were all shocked. Uh, Tyler and I were talking about this today. He's just like, I hope, well, I'll never forget that moment when we were just like, oh my God, he's coming. He's really coming. Like he's already here. The sun was shining down on me. There was like a, this light breeze it was California in the, in the early fall, so it was just perfect out, maybe 72 degrees or something. But I was confused, and I looked to them like, what do I do? <laughs> what do I do now? Um, and then I felt his ears, and that like was so soothing to me to feel his ears. In the position I was in, in the tub, I was concerned that there wouldn't be enough space in case he like, moved out very quickly. He might hit his head against the tub. So I moved on to all fours and Tyler and I were in good communication and I just asked him to hold him as he moved out of me and keep him under the water. And I just let my body push as it needed to. It was just these amazing roars coming out of me. And it was so gentle, like it was so powerful, but also so gentle. And I was in complete ecstasy this entire time. You know, I couldn't really say that I experienced pain in this birth. It was more of just a power and a bliss. So he kind of just slid out of me as Tyler held him. I turned over. Tyler passed him to me under my leg so I could so I could bring him up out of the water. And I brought him up out of the water, held him to my chest. I kind of sucked some water from his lungs from his or from his mouth. And he cried and I held him and I kind of kept him in the water. So he stayed warm. This breeze came through. Yeah. That was, I mean, there's so much more I could add, but that's like the, the basic part of the birth, I suppose. Uh, but something really profound and amazing was during that time when I looked up and I saw a circle of people around me like spiritual beings I saw I saw the same you know the same people that I saw when I um, was present with my stepmom when she passed away it was like hmm. these you know spirit beings that are kind of there to usher people in and usher people out maybe right. yeah uh, and I also saw the, the my women ancestors around me I just felt so held and so blissful and the oxytocin running through me I mean I was so high we all were it was just incredible. I mean, there's not really a, a good word besides incredible and ecstasy. <laughs> yeah. It's such a beautiful story. You know, I really love how even prior to the birth, you had the nudge to go and do this meditation retreat that really brought you deep, deep, deep into yourself. And you had the inspiration about the song that you brought and that helped to usher, you know, really act as a beacon, a mantra to bring your son forward. And I mean, and it sounds like you were very close and connected with your partner all the way through. And you know, one of the things that people often say is, oh, you know, they, they use children as this excuse for why they don't have sex. They're not, they're not intimate with their partners any longer. And what I always say in response to that is people who are close and connected prior and up to their birth, the birth becomes an experience that actually makes them even more close and connected. And then that energy, that bond is what helps them and imbues them with the superpowers they need to be parents. And when people don't have that, when there's some kind of gap with the couple, then having a baby exacerbates that distance. And then, you know, they have this excuse, this very socially accepted excuse. Oh, you have children, you haven't had sex in two years, you know? So, so I'm just curious, like, how did the, this birth experience, which sounds very deep and primal and intimate, how did that impact your relationship with your partner? Hmm. Yeah, I mean, it's definitely brought to have witnessed, for him to have witnessed me in that full power of bringing a child into the world in that like rawness and that, that primalness for him to have witnessed me in that way has evolved our relationship so much. And for me to have had such a strong support of him energetically 
and just seeing him in that space. I didn't really see him, I guess, but like feeling him in that space and him knowing his place in that birth has had major impact on our relationship in the most beautiful way. We are so, we are so close and more close since then. I mean, to have experienced that together and for him to have like held him as he came into the world, our son, and just to like, we, I mean, yeah, we all created that experience and the postpartum is so beautiful. Us just all laying in bed and so close and connected and all of us flowing with oxytocin. Yeah. And it's still, you know, our experience parenting now, I'd say like the beginning parts of parenting and figuring out how sex works. Now you have like a baby, you know, in the bed and they may cry and stuff and figuring out when, when the best time is for us to have sex with this baby here and all these things in the beginning was like definitely a lot of communication between us and figuring out how to navigate this new world of us as parents. But it's been quite easy in a, maybe not like easy, easy, but it, our communication has been simple and easy and we, we make it work. Like we, we definitely have sex and we did <laughs> this whole time that Co has been here, which has been a year. Um, and we have it you know, connect in time together and we do it with our son too. Like we're all connected and we're all bonded in a way that, yeah, there isn't the excuse of like, oh, we have a kid, so we can't do that certain thing. Um, yeah, the birth experience has definitely shaped the relationship and evolved it and just created a deeper bond between us and being parents now and making love to one another as like the parent of my child and Him making love to me has definitely shifted in a way of this like this deeper honoring of seeing me in that real, real raw power. That's wonderful. And you know what else I love about your story is that your two support people seem to really stand back and let you, your internal guidance, your body, whatever energy you were channeling, be the director. You know, you said that even your friend didn't ask you for things like she just waited to see, you know, for you to ask for something and it, even your partner. And I, you know, it's so the opposite of the typical medical birth experience, which is like, no little girl, you just sit there and we'll tell you exactly what to do every step of the way. And I love that your story is so much the opposite about people there completely honoring your power, your intuition, your you know, inner direction of exactly how this needs to go and giving you the space, you know, and the support to just be there for whatever you need, that you've got the knowledge. I love that. Yeah, it was exactly what I wanted and I asked for for from them. You know, I created like a quote unquote birth plan. It was like, trust Step aside, bitches. Trust (laughs) Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> My thing was to learn, trust me, trust birth, and do what I ask. And <laughs> that was that. <laughs> I love it. The birth plan extraordinaire. That's the best birth <laughs> plan I've ever heard. Yeah. <laughs> Wonderful. Was there anything else that you want to add to the story or the whole process that we haven't touched on yet? I guess if the placenta, if you wanted to go into that, that was kind of the experience for me. Sure. It, uh, um, yeah, I moved inside. The placenta hadn't come yet. And it ended up being about four or five hours before my placenta came which is in the hospital, they would have, you know, ramped me up with Pitocin and probably given me a catheter because it ended up being that my bladder was so full that it was inhibiting the placenta from coming out. Um, so that was quite tricky. And I was, you know, I was in pain because my bladder was so full and I was holding my baby and like, you know, kind of stressed wanting the placenta to come out. And this is where more fears came out that I hadn't really untangled beforehand. 
of like having placenta retention or hemorrhaging or whatever. So many stories that you hear about that really most of the time only happen in a medically managed birth, but I didn't really know that yet until later. So I eventually got to the space of just completely relaxing and not stressing about the placenta. And I began to chant, release, release, over and over again. And Tyler and Shay joined in with me. We were all chanting for 10 to 20 minutes. And as soon as we ended, my nose filled up with snot, you know, you know for who knows, because we had asked for it too. And I knew, and I got over the bowl, this, you know, just a kitchen bowl, and I blew my nose, and the placenta just blew out into the bowl. And it was amazing, and I was just, you know, feeling that once again, just that power of intention and that power of asking for what we want from our bodies, and knowing that we are so, our bodies are so intelligent, and our mind, and our heart, and our bodies are so sync, and really seeing that happen. And then I peed like, I don't even know, half gallon of urine twice, which was the most relieving experience. <laughs> it was almost orgasmic for sure. Um, and yeah, then I was, you know, then Shay made some placenta prints and we did a lotus birth. We kept it, I think it was, it was about 18 hours. It dried out very, very quickly. And then we did a cord burning the next morning. And then I, you know, ate my placenta that day and a few days later and actually just buried the, the rest of it um, about a week ago on my son's lunar birthday. Um, yeah, so that's the, that's the placenta part of it. <laughs> so you did the Sexy Mama Salon, although you did it after your birth experience. So how did you find the salon in terms of talking about explaining the ideas, I guess, that were guiding principles for you and affirming what you were coming to in yourself and how was the whole experience for you overall? Yeah, I really enjoyed the Sexy Mama Salon. Even though I'd already given birth, it absolutely just affirmed everything I had chosen and taught me more, you know, taught me more from your perception about things like circumcision and and conscious conception and all these things. I mean, you dove into to all the things that I would want to share with any pregnant woman who was willing to listen. It was like, you're almost like this amazing friend that women can have throughout their pregnancy and birth when they're making choices that aren't so aligned with the normal pregnancy and birthing experience that is in our culture and our country in the United States. Um, yeah. And I mean, the bonuses and things like that. I loved the one you taught about clearing the glass between your, your partner, Tyler, and I still do that. We really like that exercise. Um, we did it a couple of weeks ago and it's something that's definitely stuck with us through there. And then when you go into the, the parts about wild mothering, that was really great for me because that is where I was. You know, I was in the postpartum care and the wild mothering phase when I did this course, the salon, and it, it definitely taught me more things um, than, I, than I already knew. And it's definitely one of the things I would recommend to any pregnant mama that came to me looking at how do I have an ecstatic birth or how do I, you know, how do I enjoy my birth and my pregnancy? The salon is something I would absolutely, absolutely recommend and, you know, send over to them in a link. You got to sign up for this. Awesome. <laughs> this will definitely uh, okay. give you the tools and the offer you the, you know, like a laid out of like, Here's the work. Like, here's all these rabbit holes you can dive into, into, into creating your ideal pregnancy and birth and postpartum and motherhood. <laughs> Fantastic. Well, that's what I was hoping to do is help point out all of the 
the area is to bring people back to themselves and their own wisdom and dispel the myths and storytelling that's the modern version of what birth is meant to look like rather than, I think, the actual version of what it's meant to look like. I guess to wrap up, the song that you were singing during your birth, you actually, re- is that the song that you recorded? Mm hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So we'll put a link to that so people can have a listen to that. And you also That'd put together. Awesome. What was that? I thought that would be great. Thank yeah. you. And then you also put together a book of free birthing images. Is that correct? Yeah, it's a book of amazing, stunning uh, photography from free birth and pregnancy and some other photography too, and just musings and poetry and some really beautiful quotes um, from women who are either pregnant or they have free birthed or they're en route to conscious conception. It's a really beautiful book. What's the name of the book? It's called She Rises. She Rises, excellent. We'll we'll put information about the song and the book in the show post. All right, well, thank you so much for being here and for sharing this. I'm really, really honored and moved that you would share such a vulnerable, personal, intimate story with everyone and and to be a beacon and to really show women what's possible and to honor the wisdom and the power in their own bodies. And so salute you for your courage in doing so and coming out the other side of it transformed. Thank you, Kim. Childbirth is one of the biggest spiritual tools a woman has available to her. Throughout ancient and even recent cultures all over the world, women have been revered for their ability to bridge the worlds of life and death, to be the shaman with a direct connection to the other worlds through being the birth portal to bring in new life. The medicalization of birth has largely shit all over that notion and replaced it with a sterilized, disempowered paradigm. What I want Want for all of you to take away from this is that birth was meant to be so much more. A full rebirth of who you are and an act that prepares you emotionally and spiritually for the task of being a mother. The Sexy Mama Salon begins today. This salon is a step-by-step guide to how to deprogram yourself and learn instead to tune into all of your natural wisdom and to cultivate your sexual power and pleasure as the ultimate birthing tool. Blocks that show up in your bed will show up in your birth, meaning if you have sexual blocks within yourself and between you and your partner, they have an impact on your birthing experience, just like they have an impact on your ability to orgasm, on your libido, and the quality of your relationship. Yes, they'll also have an impact on the biggest orgasm of your life. The Sexy Mama Salon dives into everything you need to know to have a healthy and blissful pregnancy and birth, as well as how to heal and fortify your sexual relationship with yourself and your partner to create the most optimal and ecstatic birth experience. You can find the salon and free preview video series on my site, kimanami.com slash sexy dash mama. Thank you so much for listening. If you haven't already, subscribe and also leave a review and send someone else the gift of a healthy libido and an off the charts love life by sharing this episode with them. We'll be back next week. And in the meantime, many happy orgasms. 